Um, hey everyone, thank you for coming uh, to the third lecture in Tripod's lecture series. Um, so for those of you who don't know, here at Tripod, uh, well, we it's a creative co-working space um, and we also, it's part of Mima space, which develops um, like underutilized spaces for uh, community and um, kind of local businesses. Um, and we're lucky enough to be surrounded by really innovative, creative people who work in design and tech, some of which are part of the Brixton Project. Um, and so here to speak to you today is Sarah, Charlie and Binky from the Brixton Project. Um, and they work with loads of local artists to create what they call participatory placemaking. Um, they work on the principle that development should take place with the locals and not to the locals, um, be that workers or residents or anyone involved. Um, and so after a super challenging year for everyone, especially creatives, um, uh, the creative community has had to learn valuable lessons about how to diversify their practices and transfer their work all online. Um, and so today, Sarah, Charlie and Binky are going to reflect on their experiences um, and kind of communicate that of the designers and artists they work with and also of themselves in their own company. Um, so just to let you all know, we're going to record this lecture so it can be uploaded to the Tripod website and rewatched. I will send you all a link later so you can circulate it to anyone that's missed it. Um, if you've got any questions, um, maybe just leave them in the chat and we can pick them up at the end. Um, and, um, and yeah, so Sarah, Binky and Charlie, thank you very much for making the time to be a part of this um, and share your experiences. Um, over to you guys. Well, Alex, thanks thank so much for having us. Um, it's, it's a really great opportunity to, you know, it's been a great opportunity for all of us to reflect on what's happened uh, and very much to look forward as well. So for us, um, and thanks for also um, alerting us to the fact that this is being recorded, so we'll try not to say anything naughty, but you know, you, you, you never know, especially with that one, the Waterhouse. So um, Unconfined is a talk about adaption and transition uh, for Brixton's creative community from Brixton's creative community. Um, myself, Charlie and Sarah are partners at the Brixton Project, um, form formally established two years ago after a life as Brixton Design Trail. So most people are kind of familiar with the very visible aspects of our work where we have helped um, the creative community to deliver installations and projects across the town centre on bridges and walls and pavements. And it's work that's deeply embedded in the local culture and is part of shaping uh, Brixton as this most amazing creative um, sand pit, uh, play space, uh, live space, workspace uh, that we are all very much part of. Um, these days, we also manage the community aspects of the Creative Enterprise Zone and uh, Make It, uh, which is a platform we launched earlier this year. Uh, we live on the sixth floor of International House uh, alongside, um, again, the most uh, amazing and distinctive family of creative businesses and social enterprises who are all working in various different ways on uh, the future of Brixton, really. Um, as three people, as three partners, we bring slightly different perspectives to this subject and that in itself is a bit of a window into how we work and um, in a highfalutin way you could say into our combined practice, uh, but actually it's a sort of chaotic coming together, but it, it kind of works uh, uh, and it works for us and it, we hope it trans that translates onto the street. Um, so. Sarah will talk about how we have responded to the challenges of producing work during the first lockdown and what we've developed as a kind of resilience engine to amplify the local creative economy. Um, I'll talk about the perfect storm I feel is occurring in all of us on a kind of, you know, deeply personal level, I suppose, for a creatively driven uh, recovery. And Charlie will pull it all together in, um, what can I say, in a, an expansive meander, um, which kind of always leaves us breathless um, in its, yeah, well, kind of in its beauty, but it gives us all a shared vision and something to really kind of like, you know, grasp and, and come together on. So as much as anything, I think um, the next 20 minutes is as much um, 
an invitation and a call to action, um, which we're, we're, we're kind of pretty good at really. So um, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Um, hello everyone. Um, yes. Uh, okay. So, I mean, even though we've worked together, as Binky says, um, for over six years delivering the Brixton Trail, Design Trail, um, as a Brixton project, um, we are a two-year-old business. Birthday's actually today, by the way, happy birthday partners. Um, and we have experience one year in and one year out of pandemic. So a very good comparison. The Brixton project is fueled by community engagement. Thank you. Face-to-face <laughs> um, -face discussions, creative and social interactions, openness and inclusivity. So before the pandemic, we existed to do this in the real world. Uh, you know, we only use digital channels to support our work and communications. So the weight of the balance changed rapidly for us and our creative network because of the pandemic. So how do we react? Uh, suddenly we were prepping to ensure we were able to communicate on, you know, over new digital tools and applications, trying different ways to, you know, to make sure we could actually achieve the same work. We found that hard being able to work face to face on video call with rows of people staring back at you. I'm sure you all would appreciate that. And not being able to replicate the chemistry of meeting in person, sharing an exciting idea, demonstrating an emotive concept or encouraging all to participate. While the others are on calls are being distracted by pinging their screens or not, you're not heard because someone's over talking over you or you've really got patchy connection. That's happened to most of us. The whole experience was less rewarding and often exasperating. Then came the questions, did you come across okay? You know, how well did they take in what you said? Did they understand the idea? You know, all the work involved or did they get what you're about? You know, it's all very difficult to understand when you're fixed on the screen and you're trying to gauge everyone's um, emotions. All difficult to comprehend when not in a room together as well. A new way of learning. So there were definite moments of, uh, as we came across last year. As a team, we were forced to adapt each step to open new ways for us to create a new togetherness that we were all missing. Togetherness that made us work better, produce successful engagements and still connect and expand and support our creative network. Letting go from the usual processes we we're familiar with and creating alternative ones to bring out about a new way of working in this small light -like box that we found. It affected people's attention spans. It affected their concentration. It made us reflect more on people's emotions and state of mind. We had to remember our humanity lived outside of the screen we were invested in on a daily basis. It was difficult, but it became easier. We learned, we adapted, we changed. So how do we do this? All of a sudden, projects that were meant to be realized in the community are no longer viable in their current form. We had to find new solutions to engage community. So we got our thinking caps on. An example of how we did this was Windrush Day 2020 last year. Uh, we worked alongside Lambeth Events to deliver a programme of community engagement that worked within the new lockdown constraints. We were contracted to develop and deliver a creative strategy to maximise the opportunity for local people of all ages to participate in a celebration of Windrush Day without a mass gathering. Quite tricky, all to be realised remotely in six weeks. We imagined a different way for the community to interact and participate by creating an arts and music activation to create a sense of collective togetherness that we were able to see, hear, share at home and on school. Against the backdrop of George Floyd's, George Floyd, eh, sorry, George Floyd's murder, <laughs> get my mouth around that bit, um, the rising COVID infection rate for people of colour locally and the unearthing of the government's Windrush scandal, celebration was a difficult ask but coming together in a solidarity worked for us. Despite the challenges, this project succeeded in achieving a high level of public participation and engagement. Via artworks displayed in windows, singing on doorsteps, school children singing from their playgrounds and interactions with our social media campaign. Moreover though, through targeted engagement, we grew support for the Windrush community in Brixton, facilitating exchange and engagement by both social media and the streets of neighbourhoods. Another example of how we did this was Make It in Brixton. As Binky mentioned earlier, 
We were contracted in November 2019 to manage and deliver program events and community development to establish Brixton's Creative Enterprise Zone that was awarded by the GLA. The official launch was scheduled for spring 2020, slightly difficult in when the pandemic started. But as we had to delay the launch and reevaluate our plans and strategy, we had to be responsive to the needs of the creative community to revolve around practical assistance, inspiration and collaboration. We had to make a quick decision to utilize digital channels to achieve part of the delivery. We had engaged our creative community with an extensive COVID related social media campaign following a survey we undertook, providing them support, collaborations and opportunities. In addition, using our network for local creative talent to wider audiences. This culmination is the, was Make It in Brixton platform and a shared identity. And we also created the Women's Creative Network. So we've used our time to further develop this community focused content for the website. And throughout the pandemic, we have continued to develop these network access and replan the program, which hopefully was finally launched in January this year. So we tackled the new way of working and coped in creating that togetherness we strive for. However, we know all too well that many creatives or creative businesses from our network and community struggled last year. Everything from a lack of work or the ability to continue producing their creativity in the way they knew. Who now needed a, a workspace interior designer? Who could now get to purchase your creative wares with, from shops when they were closed? How are you going to photograph people in empty streets? How could you work with your children needing your undivided attention? The lockdown was a massive upheaval to creatives. Suddenly, with the normal disrupted, they had to find a different place to practice and had a different way of thinking. Suddenly, they had to have a new narrative and approach to their creative output. Some creatives were able to adapt easily and take on the challenge. Some found it harder to change. The online platforms were occupied by creatives sharing their craft with people further afield, opening up experiences and collaborations that they never thought of. It often brought people more together, even though in an online environment. Some embraced the change to make a new career path or business for themselves. Some even took this opportunity, maybe a push from redundancy or being losing their job, to change their careers to creative one they had always wanted to pursue. Some creators found it hard to inspire themselves from being at home and not surround themselves with creativity. It was stressful, mentally challenging and unfulfilling. Let alone the impact of COVID-19 itself affecting our friends, family and our community. A lot to be taken in, in a year. There's been a lot of learning of how we do things differently or how we did them before. But now how can we take them to going out of COVID? There's a question there, which uh, will answer questions at the end, hopefully. I was just about to say, we'll, um, we'll get to questions in the yeah. end. Um, so yeah, fill up the chat, please. Uh, we're ready. Um, so picking up from, from Sarah, and, and now how can we take these things to coming out of, out of COVID? Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a flip and take us back to actually um, Christmas 2019 and because that's actually a pretty difficult point in time to imagine uh, from here um, but we've given it a name and we call it normal um, Sarah referred to normal but in fact I think that life was anything but normal at that time and, and that's one of the, the greatest revelations of this period perhaps um, the pandemic has catalyzed an era of um, irrevocable change forcing us all to adapt at speed. Again, really well illustrated by Sarah's examples. Um, amongst many other things, working from home and the uncertainty of where work is gonna come from and the reconfiguration of family life and how we connect, all things that Sarah has illustrated. It's also provided us with a really hard stop to systems, beliefs and behaviors that were the building blocks of what we did call normal. However, many of us were previously aware of and uncomfortable with and upset by the mounting evidence of a world underpinned by greed, corruption, injustice and destruction, we were very much on the wrong side of power to lead change. The 15 months of pandemic has drawn back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz and shown us the full 
expanse of the problem. So we're now all acutely aware of personal and collective suffering more profoundly than most of us have ever experienced. It's an unbearable level of problem, both deeply personal and shared. It's brought us together and we have now a greater sense of interdependence with the planet and everyone on it. Uh, and I feel that this takes us to a place of a perfect storm to apply creativity to that problem with a greater sense of responsibility and purpose in the work that we all do to heal and to make change. Knowing that the pebbles that we skim in Brixton will resonate with ripples and waves uh, in the global uh, revolution. For the first time since the Renaissance, um, with most other systems of thinking and ordering of the world failing us and the planet, the world can be led creatively. These are the conversations that we're having at the Brixton Project and our invitation to the creative community and everybody on this call is to work together on a transition for Brixton and beyond. Um, Charlie's going to talk a little bit more about that in detail shortly. Um, the local landscape of stakeholders, the Business Improvement District, Lambeth Council, the GLA, all have a, a raft of overlapping and kind of overwhelming <laughs> initiatives that signal their need for this recovery to be creatively driven. Uh, whether it's reimagining our high streets or redesigning our local neighbourhoods with your street, our streets your way or your streets our way, I can't quite remember which way around it goes, we are being called upon as a creative community to solve our social issues creatively and as a creative community. Um, our recent work to deliver a launch programme for... Oh, Sarah, you've just blotted me out there. Um, to deliver a launch programme for 81 Acts of Exuberant Defiance is a year-long commemoration of the uprisings of 1981 that began in Brixton. The, the programme of work exemplifies the interconnectedness of the task ahead. We're working with a network of artists and activists to realise a series of events across 2021 that will help all local people understand what happened and how little has changed, and also how to begin the reset on the marginalisation of people of colour. So where does this sit in the bigger picture? of what it, is, what it is to lead an essentially creative life. Charlie is going to introduce us to the responsibility we have as individuals and the opportunity we have as a community. Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Binky. Um, so as Binky's introduction really eloquently described, we're, we're currently in a, in a liminal time a confused time in between, a time awaiting great um, upheaval. And we believe that creativity has a, has a fundamental role in how we're going to navigate this period. COVID has been a timely wake up call, should we choose to, to hear it. But, but I would argue that it has not been the upheaval itself. Despite its many challenges, more what it's done is to steer us to a, a frame of mind that is able to embrace change in a way that was much more difficult to contemplate before last year we have quite literally been gifted 2020 vision we can see much of what surrounds us with more clarity and i think that in the first lockdown with all its novelty <clears throat> and associated fear we were very much living in our heads if we were lucky enough to not become ill and lucky enough to have space to relocate from offices, um, we, we, in, we sort of enjoyed a, a, a COVID coping bounce. Some of us, if we were working, might have been furloughed. Others might have got a break from mortgages or rent. Some of us even managed to do bits of work and we somehow survived. And as we survived in this new weird world where we weren't quite so wedded to the hamster wheel and where the wheel maybe slowed itself enough to take the edge off as we saw clear skies and heard birds in the city many expressed an unwillingness to go back to the old normal that Binky and Sarah have both talked about but then we got a glimpse of what going back to normal might look like 
the clarion call for everyone to get back to work, to pack out the pubs, to get on the planes, to have that foreign holiday we, we all deserved. And that eager rush to feed the economy undoubtedly hastened our return to a second period of lockdowns, this time with none of the novelty, nor the helping hand of the arrival of spring to take the edge off. This time, as we emerge more tentatively into the wider world, I wonder how many of us don't simply think we want to change, but know that's what we want. How many of us have moved our desire from our head to our heart? But at the same time, how many of us don't quite know what that means? Can't exactly see the way that change can happen with us and not to us. And that's where unconfined creativity comes in. Now, Binky was just talking about the Renaissance, and I would like to see her re Renaissance and raise her the romantics. There's a wonderful writer called John Higgs, whose next book out in May is about one of Lambeth's most amazing former residents. In William Blake versus the world, he explores the enduring re relevance of this 18th century visionary. And I pestered him over email last week about a project I'd like to con him into. And he replied in part with this absolutely wonderful summation. And he said, William Blake's understanding of the mind is profound and of vital importance. He could see clearly the mind forged manacles that keep people in their old way of thinking and unable to process and react appropriately to the changing climate. He saw people trapped in the small, finite, rational worlds of their left brains, and he knew we needed to transcend that limited reality tunnel if we were ever to grasp the larger picture. And as he says time and time again, it's only imagination that can enlarge the world. Blake is difficult in himself and hard to present to a wide public, but he is required reading for artists hoping to push their audience into a larger holistic understanding. And it's that larger holistic under understanding where, where I think that the creative industry's responsibility lies as we emerge from COVID into a world that is way more uncertain than the prevailing narrative would have us believe. It's a world where our notions of work have been thoroughly upended. I mean, I don't know who here tonight lost work in the last year in an instant without so much as a buy your leave for it not to return. It's a world where our notion of safety net, if we had any scrap of that concept remaining, was thoroughly shredded as we likely failed to secure any financial assistance. It's a world where increasingly AI seeks to control us, the environment to damage us. COVID is but a taste of what's to come. And so how does the old normal cope with such challenges? Seemingly by waging a culture war where we're encouraged to fight over our differences, lose our shit over loss of freedoms or polarizing politics. One only has to look at the UK media, social media, or heaven help us, WhatsApp or next door to see we're in a cesspit of division. But that's not the only story. The pitting of reality tunnel ideologies against each other is only reality if we give it permission. And while we're seeing some divisions loom large here in Lambeth over low traffic neighbourhoods or housing or town centre towers, we're also seeing ever more willingness for people to work together, to share skills and opportunities, to apply transdisciplinary approaches to problems. And as we gradually become unconfined, we have an opportunity or rather a responsibility to work in a more open and accountable way because we're the people who can harness imagination. We're the people daft enough to dream up the impossible, to show what might be if we could only look up from the gruel the system currently serves. There's a development mantra here in Lambeth that says the money has run out. So we have to sell the family silver. It's counter spies gentrification in every direction, each resolute in their own ideology, each seemingly incapable of imagining an alternative reality. And what plays out on Brixton streets is writ ever larger in London, the UK and the world beyond. And it's not just development, of course, such polarized antagonism runs through the battle of business and protest as usual. Life imitating Twitter. But what if we imagine new ways of doing things, new collaborations, new communities? What if we channel Buckminster Fuller, who memorably said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. 
His words are echoed by author Ursula K. Le Guin, and she said, the exercise of imagination is dangerous to those who profit from the way things are, because it has the power to show that the way things are is not permanent, not universal, not necessary. And where lies imagination, if not in our collective creative minds, the opportunity is ours to seize. If we so choose, we can be the alchemists, the catalysts. What Lambeth, what London can we conjure if we collectively put our minds to it? Writers, designers, artists, actors, performers, architects. If we put our unconfined creativity to the service of the collective good, what different future will be imagined for all? And once pictured the leaden acolytes of Armageddon cannot wipe that vision. We have nothing to lose but our mind-forged manacles and literally everything to gain. That's why we are throwing everything into Make It in Brixton, the Creative Enterprise Zone's championing of creativity that, uh, that Sarah was talking about. That's why we're working with 81 Acts of Exuberant Defiance as they develop a creative response to 40 years of struggle post uprising. That's why the Brixton Project will be fighting tooth and nail to preserve the amazing collaborative cross disciplinary community of inter International House where I am tonight that hasn't even had a chance to emerge butterfly-like from lockdown to fully realize its potential. That's why we're launching an exploratory symposium in September for Brixton to tell its unheard stories, celebrate its unheralded heroes and face up to its unreconciled differences. That's gonna be called the space in between. And there's an open invitation for, for everybody in the community to, to, to play a part in that. And that's why in April, 2022, we're going to be hosting a, a, a really ambitious co-created festival of urban imagination, 99% Brixton, where for two weeks, we're going to bring the community together to get hands on exploring other futures. In the, um, just, to, just to finish, in, in, in the Paris of 1968, graffiti appeared across the city as, as, as everybody was, was rising up in defiance, heralding an alternative reality. And the pick of the messages is one I think um, us creatives must hold dear as we emerge unconfined and please excuse my pronunciation but but the graffiti um, said soyez realist demandez l'impossible be realistic demand the impossible thank you charlie i i, I kind of warned everybody <laughs> it would be um you know, this, this is something that you kind of can't row back from, and it is an invitation that we would love you all to take take seriously. Um, Alex, we're really happy to take questions. Just just let us know how how you'd like to proceed. I'm a bit blown away by that. I feel like I was given like <laughs> so much emotive information. It was um, also so refreshing. Like such a lovely. I don't know. It's it's you know it's it's fascinating to not just think about this in such a I feel like people have often been you know very polite and practical with all of it um but actually if you think about it from a philosophical sense of like such a um a key pivotal time in history and something that designers can really use as um uh, a catalyst for change I think it's you know it's amazing that there are people like yourself like the Brixton Project that are pushing that um because I think it's necessary and I think people need to know that there's like space and a platform for that um and the, you know, the feeling of um, desire for change that you to speak about, I completely agree. It feels so necessary. Um, and I guess um, because designers are, uh, they have the ability to communicate with everyone. They're often kind of put at the forefront or they often are at the forefront of all of this. Um, I wondered, are there any particular designers and artists that you have in mind that you guys are really excited to see work from? Uh, locally or... Yeah, locally. I mean, and 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 wider. Well, the 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 thing what we what we have actually discovered this year is um, lots of young people who are just really have through projects that we've we've kind of managed to rope them into, have embarked on creative careers, having um, actually practiced new levels of creativity throughout throughout lockdown 
Um, and they're doing amazing work. I mean, there, there's one guy that I came across recently called Zabi Art, and he only picked up a paintbrush a year ago and he's creating the most, um, yeah, really joyful, playful, but actually quite deep um, kind of cubist work. Um, and he's doing that to support as much as he can um, to funnel money into um, mental health charities for young uh, men of color. So he, he, he did a, he did had an exhibition at Coin Street and Coin Street have a, they have a little hold on there. There's a gallery right in the Oxo Tower and I think they have free space in there or they give free space in there. And over the period of an exhibition, <laughs> of that exhibition time, I think it must have been in between the two lockdowns where he was just going nuts. He managed to raise a phenomenal amount of money. He, he raised like, I don't know, six, seven, eight thousand pounds in a week. Um, and that has been funneled into charity to, directly to help people. So then you can you can see the relationship between actually there is somebody who um, supported his own mental health by learning how to paint during lockdown. He then picks that up and he takes that to a community of people who he knows are suffering particularly badly at this moment. And he you know the transition that he makes creates real cold hard cash that is going to help people you know so it's not you know beyond this sort of airy fairiness of the 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 the, the visioning what we are seeing is there is a real pathway to creating change and each and any, every one of us can be involved in doing it sounds ah. amazing okay. I, want to, I want to see his work um i'll try and find a link and pop it in the chat yeah, yeah, please I do. I think that's the that's the thing that comes from comes from working like the work that we did with the Brixton Design Trail and what we're what we're trying to do is, is work with often people who don't, don't necessarily class themselves as sort of artists or creatives. We're trying to sort of tease that out of people. Um, a because you get really amazing results, you get truly joyous work, but also the the act of doing things together is absolutely amazing. And so I think um, so, so, so much of our education system um, is designed to, to kind of iron that kind of expression out. And if you, if you decide to specialize in one, you know, kind of what, what used to be called, or probably still are, you know, sort of more academic subjects, you then, you then don't have, you don't, you feel that you can't be creative and everybody can be creative. And, and once you start sort of working with that and unlock, unlocking it, it's wonderful to sing together, to, to, to make clothes together, even if it's really badly is, is such a, such a great opportunity for, for, for kind of communion. It's almost a spiritual thing. Um, and if we can't, if we can't like kind of work with that after the year we've all just had where, we, where we've been physically you know kind of unable to, to do that then we're going to miss a massive opportunity mm, definitely i agree um i'm just going to ask a few questions from the chat if that's okay mm. yeah so uh one of them is can you expand a bit on targeted engagement how do you ensure you get the same local reach one person at a time <laughs> <laughs> I was going to just say that um, we, you know, we have um, we've worked hard on building a very strong network with our community, and you know, inviting people for collaboration and ensuring that we keep communication always through um, our networks, be it key organi art organisations that support youth investment, um, schools, you know, everything from to the neighbour the local neighbourhood forums, because as Charlie says, everyone is creative. And, you know, if you're writing or you're just a creative thinker, it's, you don't have to produce something. It's just asking everyone to participate. And I think that's the key thing is that we've, we ensure because we know we've, we know Brixton really well. Um, and we've, we've established uh, this kind of really strong collaboration between partners. And I'll just add, sorry, a, add into yeah, that, add into that. A, a little bit. Um, Aaron, it's, it's, it has to be multi-layered. So it happens on lots of different levels and in lots of different ways. 
So one of the campaigns that we've been running recently is a mail art campaign. So that literally means physically posting a, a, a postcard through letterboxes and um, asking people to draw paint on, on a subject and then post them back to the Brixton project. So in that way, we can target a, a specific community of people or a, an area with a question or an idea and they can respond to that. And, um, you know, we're, we're lucky that also through through lockdown, we've, as, as, a, as a community, everybody's discovered skills, you know, everybody's, you know, sits down to draw or write or whatever and you know it's one of the one of the um um outtakes of, of, of being bored and having lots of time so uh, little initiatives like that have actually been incredibly successful we've done a really good one with um the bay tree um center and um we've done one on railton road um and there were very you know there are more coming because it's a very good way for brixton to kind of express itself visually that's just just one example. I'd also I'd also add it, it's whenever we're taking any campaign or any kind of engagement, we we tackle, we make sure that we every everything we do is accessible. You know, it's it's very well that we put everything digitally up on you know online, but a lot you know a lot of people don't have digital access as you you know as it's been highlighted throughout the year. Some people don't even have devices in their families. So we've been making sure that those things are, as Binky says, they're posted through doors and they're notified in a different way because it's key to make sure you communicate with the audience in a way that they live their lives. Um, thank you, guys. These are such... Uh, we've actually got such good questions in the chat. I'm, um, so I'm just going to try and get as many of them in as possible, if that's all right with you guys. Um, next one is... The Brixton project seems like such a unique initiative. What was it born out of? Who, who wants to take that one? When well, you take that one, I've got my eyes on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have the next one. Why did that not surprise me? <laughs> this is how no. we work. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's born out of um, several years of us working together as um, volunteers on the Brixton Design Trail, and even before Brixton Design Trail, some of us were involved in something called uh, We Love Brixton. So we responded to the 2011 riots by putting the giant letters We Love Brixton made out of chipboard on the Windrush Square. And that became a little bit of a wall of responding to what had just happened. Um, it was a day of uh, people coming together and singing and dancing and all sorts of things that we haven't been able to do in the last couple of years, but it kind of it kind of sowed a seed of the power of uh, creativity to heal, to bring people together, but also to kind of like forge a way forward. Um, and it was also very evident um, of how it uplifted people um, in that moment, which was again a, a particularly desperate moment for for Brixton. So that's what it that's what it came out of. We called the Brixton Project, because obviously we're talking about this because there are times when we'd like to work in other places than Brixton. <laughs> but um, we called the Brixton Project because we feel that the work we are all doing um, is the Brixton Project. So we just ha happen to be um, out there on the front line as cheerleaders uh, and hopefully just you know kind of encouraging people to come with us but the work that we are all doing um, in developing Brixton as a creative community um, developing Brixton in a way as a place that we want to live and we can live and a place that we all feel part of and we all belong to which is um, significantly a challenge uh, at times that is the Brixton project you know so the amplifi amplification of our culture using creativity to to address challenges that is the Brixton project um, so yeah it's again it, it's another invitation for everybody to be part of uh, it's not just us geezers sitting on the on the sixth floor it's all of us I think it's so valid I think that um, more boroughs should have a project <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm just gonna quickly move on. So um, Jen has asked, if creativity is unconfined, is it necessarily a force for good? Are there darker elements coming out of change and social pressures? And could there be creative impulses that increase division? Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll put dibs on that one. Um, I feel really strongly about this. Um, the qualification of, of asking if creativity is unconfined, is it necessarily a force for good? I think is, I think is interesting. Um, creativity is absolutely not a force for good in large um, areas of its application. We're surrounded by creativity. We're surrounded, propaganda is creative. Um, advertising is creative. Branding is creative. Um, when, um, when a missile drops on a Yemeni child, someone's designed the logo that's on the side of the missile. When, um, when an oil spill happens in um, the Caribbean, somebody has designed or created the infrastructure around that when the press release is sent out to um to sort of manage reputations that's an act of creativity so in itself creativity is something that is is often is often quite literally weaponized um and and i think if you if you then unconfine it i think as a as a thing as a notion i i really do want to believe that creativity is more likely to be a force for good um, and that's kind of that was the sort of that's the thinking behind my my kind of rant at the end of our opening session, um, and that creativity is a it, unconfined creativity is something that can help translate this future for, for for other people and can maybe bring people together across difference. But there's a really inter the most in interesting um, part of this question for me: could there be creative imp impulses that increase division? I think. There's definitely um, a, a vital role for creativity to play to step into division, um, because you know, we've become increasingly unable to to understand things from somebody else's point of view, to to, to express or even understand what empathy might be. You're either um, a Brexiter or a Remainer. You're a Trump supporter or you're not. You either like Black Lives Matter or you don't. You, you know, I mean, everything is this polarized um, oppositional. Um, situation so that when it comes down to do we do something about traffic in our neighborhoods everyone goes absolutely nuts and and people don't have their voices heard people don't have a chance to interact with each other in, in a way that 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 you get if you can sort of sit around a table and discuss so um so there's a role i think for for creativity to step into that division and and, and also sometimes to divide because because um it, it, change is divisive inspiration is divisive and, and if we don't if if we don't open up the possibility to have those difficult grown-up conversations we'll never get past them and then then things are, are, de are determined simply by who has more power than somebody else so it's a really kind of nuanced thing i think it's it's a, it's a really sort of vital energy that that creativity has and that's why there's a we have we have this amazing opportunity to use it in a responsible way um and be the translator and i always come back to um sorry i'm i'm going on a bit now i will stop in a second but for me i always get i always get taken back to to, to, to I get in a time machine and I go just up the road to the globe and I'm in, in the world of Shakespeare and you have the fool who sits on the on the sort of the howling heath with King Lear and because he's a creative character and because no one really takes takes him seriously he can properly speak truth to power and he can say the things that nobody else can and in doing that it helps the story move on and resolve itself it helps it helps get round obstructions and things like that and so so yeah absolutely um i i think it needs to be um it, it absolutely should and must be a force for good and i think it generally is but it's also often co-opted into the service of things that don't help and, and that's where our responsibility lies because it's not good enough to just go back and do the same old same old now and and just justify it by oh well i'm being paid or what else will i do um because yeah i will now stop you'll be glad to know <laughs> no it's fascinating i don't no, I mean that i appreciate the um shakespeare reference as well really <laughs> um there are two more questions in the chat and both of them are um i think really really nice ones to end on so i might just group them together and then you guys can kind of um chuck it chuck it all into into one so um from 
Lydia, she says, it's incredibly refreshing to hear positive hope for creativity in Brixton. How can people get involved? And um, Kate has asked, any top tips for generating creative enterprise zone in my area? How do you get things moving in a small way? So um, really nice way to kind of draw things to a close. What, what can everyone do to be involved? Right. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to insist that, that everybody gets in touch tomorrow at uh, Sarah, is it info at make it make it what's what's the address? Um, oh, Hello. Gets Hello. Involved Hello. I'll put it. I'll put it in the panel. If you so can put it in the it. chat, that would be great. So, um, yeah, join Make It, become part of Make It, and then you, um, yeah, we can update you on um, all that is happening, and um, you can absolutely get involved in the very many things that are happening and being planned and also chuck your ideas into the ring um so yeah we, we we really look forward to that and it's also you know that gives you an opportunity to put up a profile to talk to other people just generally join in the various conversations that we're we're having next month is is an interesting one we're exploring the mind and creativity so you know again after the experiences we've all had it's all pretty close to the surface our, our emotional makeup and how we have uh, found personal levels of resilience or not to what's been going on around us so we're going to explore the mind um, and then following that we've got a month of architecture around the London Festival of Architecture so interesting things coming up um, and they are they never have a kind of straightforward take on them, as you can probably um, guess from from this chat. Kate, uh, love to talk to you more about uh, wherever you are. Where are you? <laughs> um, we can we can absolutely talk about how how you get started in uh, bringing people together um, to um, create happenings that other people can share share in and participate in easily. Um, Yes, very happy to have that conversation, but um, yeah, interested to know where, where you are um, and how it's, how it's faring. I mean, you know, Brixton and Lambeth is pretty good, but I'm, I am aware that there are all sorts of boroughs out there who are, who are trying to do amazing work. Sutton is one of them. Haringey is another one. Um, Tower Hamlets is another one. So they, they you know, they do, they do exist just outside Oxford. Right, we, 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 we've been after a day trip for some time, so <laughs> it will come up your way. Um, and interesting, actually, it's, it's interesting because um, somebody, um, one of our um, early supporters when we were all volunteers, um, a guy called Tom, Tom Bridgman, who used to work in regeneration uh, for Lambeth Council, he is now in Oxford. He's a great person, so if you're anywhere near that, go, go look him up and just say, um, the Brixton Project suggested that I got in touch with you. What do I do? Because he was incredibly supportive. And I think you do need to find um, a champion. I'll put it here. Um... Well, Spinky's doing that as well. It's that kind of thing of, of how do you get things moving in a small way is without wanting to sound trite, you get things moving in a small way and not be put off by not knowing what the, what, what the end is. Because I don't think any of us thought that we'd have you know, kind of involvement in, in doing something like a creative enterprise zone a few years ago when we were, you know, scrabbling around trying to do a sort of a, 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 a you know, learning how to do a public art engagement sort of exercise without any budget or, or knowing who was going to help us and, and things like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, that, that is really about, as Charlie said, it's taking it from the head and putting it in the heart. You know, what we did when we started out with Bricks and Design Trail it was all heart and it, it it was quite mad at times and we were did find ourselves going yeah we're just going to spray the payment and we'd spray the payment and then i would get a call in the middle of the night from a really upset highways person who said, i spend all my life trying to stop people do tagging and doing graffiti and you're doing it in front of me you know so they're all you think oh yeah god poor guy no uh, we need to just work out a better way to do that in the in the future um so you know it is all of this is is you know one step at a time, and as at at the same time, again another paradox. At the same time, the impact is amazing and it's incredibly serious. Not to take yourself too seriously 
um, within it, I think is is also really important. You know that that you know a level of um, humility and just enjoying the enjoying it, enjoying the, the bringing of people together, in enjoying the joy that um, the process actually creates. Uh, yeah. Thing that we've always really invested in. Um, so yeah, if that's if that's helpful. The way you guys talk about it makes me want to work with you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Oh. At some well, point. well, yeah, it's actually really boring, and we don't like each other much. <laughs> That's why we're all in different places. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm just really conscious of the time, but um, I think that's been a really, really well-rounded conversation. Um, so, um, I think if that's okay with everyone, I might draw this to a close. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, mm -hmm. Sarah, Charlie and Binky for being involved. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you guys. Pleasure. Um, thank you for and, having us. Uh, yeah, it's such an, it, like these conversations are so important and um, it's a pleasure to, you know, have an insight into what you guys do and how it all works and a bit of the behind the scenes. Um, and uh, really looking forward to when you guys can go um, actual physical again, but also I think the work that you guys have done online is amazing. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I'll definitely take you up on a visit when you are having guests in the office. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> you so um, the recording will be online um, on the Tripod website, um, which you can find at Tripod. Um, I actually don't know the exact address, but I'm sure I can find it for everyone. Um, but yeah, thank you so very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Nice yeah. to meet you.